thank goodness uh, people are exploiting Africa by buying things from it, by investing in it, by employing people in it. And the worst thing that would happen is if people decide to stop exploiting Africa. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here with Leon Lowe, author, policy analyst, and executive director of the Free Market Foundation, a think tank based in South Africa. Leon, thank you very much for talking to us. It's my pleasure, Zach. Some of your earliest political involvement was in South Africa's anti-apartheid movement. Um, can you describe what that experience was like and, and how it shaped your political outlook? I came from a family and a background which was very staunchly supportive of the apartheid philosophy. Uh, when I became a student and started reading and thinking philosophically and attending lectures, I became for a few years a communist. And uh, that is typically what you were if you were staunchly anti-apartheid and a white or European South African. I knew all of the leading figures, the Mandela family, the Tutu family and others. Something I'm very proud of today, that I was a communist is a bit perplexing to me now, but it seemed to make sense at the time. Where did that political evolution begin? Well, it was uh, not some profound uh, influence like reading Atlas Shrugged or Robert Heinlein. It was something more mundane and actually for me much more important. I was a young legal clerk at that stage and was walking out of our office to deliver some documents or pleadings. And in the street near our building was a little old lady who used to sit on the side of the road uh, vending fruit and vegetables, a fruit vendor, a street vendor. I saw her when I was walking along in her direction leap up and run away around the corner and I couldn't understand why. And then next thing I saw a police car pull up. One policeman chased her around the corner, another ran up to her basket of fruit and her money and kicked it and it went rolling across the road. And uh, I was just appalled, it was outrageous, so I couldn't understand why nobody else was. I took the rest of the day off actually, got into a lot of trouble with my employer over it and went down to the police station and negotiated and protested and arranged uh, her release. And I walked away thinking to myself, well that's interesting because as a communist I ought to be against her being able to be a street trader. That's what communism is against and suddenly struck me that she was actually a capitalist. I regard her as being the first capitalist I ever met and the first one who I admired and the first one for whose rights I decided to dedicate the rest of my life fighting. When you look at the rankings of prosperity in different African countries, South Africa and usually Botswana tend to rank near the top of those lists. Is there anything that other countries in the region can learn from these two examples? Botswana is the shining story, is the extraordinary story of the world, frankly. Um, it has had the highest growth rate averaged over the last 30 years of any country in the world. I mean, few people know that. They think it's China or Hong Kong or India or Singapore or somewhere. Botswana, unlike most African countries, never adopted what was strangely called African socialism, a strange term because socialism is, of course, an inherently European idea. It was never part of African tradition. Communalism was, but there was a great deal of personal freedom and entrepreneurship and village markets characterized Africa. So uh, Botswana uh, embarked right from the beginning on pro-market policies, had a relatively free economy by world standards, and South Africa did too. Under apartheid, it was really quite simple. White South Africans had one of the freest economies on earth, and black South Africans had one of the most socialistic economies on earth, one of the closest things ever to the elimination of class under, under apartheid. And uh, so what happened when there was liberation for blacks is they largely adopted the freedoms whites have, which meant South Africa be, rose on the economic freedom indices and became um, uh, something like about the 40th freest economy on earth. But the even better news is that the rest of Africa is uh, pr privatizing, liberalizing, democratizing and embarking on classical liberal uh, uh, path of development and is now the sub-Saharan African region, is now the highest growth region in the world. What are a couple of the most important reforms that have been pushing this uh, incredible uh, growth and development? Well, uh, liberalization, privatization. Uh, Nigeria, for example, has announced the, uh, the breakup of its uh, nationalized, centralized electricity utility. And the more important one is the simple liberalization of the ability of people to start a small business, 
trading licenses and less regulations. Take Rwanda, for example, an extraordinary story, amazing story. Starbucks uh, now is buying much of its coffee from Rwanda. That was inconceivable when it was one of the most genocidal, conflict-ridden, backward, poor places on earth. The president of Rwanda has instituted a one-stop shop system. It is quick and easy to go into business. You don't deal with more than one government agency. It sees to it that all of the other requirements are met. It's free and is growing at very high growth rates. So it's the old story, liberalizing and privatizing. It's not rocket science, it's not complicated. It's it, everywhere it's done, it works, it never fails. The critics of liberalization or globalization often say that there's exploitation going on. Is Africa being exploited by the rest of the world? Well, the famous British economist who regarded herself as a socialist, Joan Robinson, said there's only one worse thing than being exploited, and it's not being exploited. And so, yes, it is being exploited. Thank goodness uh, people are exploiting Africa by buying things from it, by investing in it, by employing people in it. And the worst thing that would happen is if people decide to stop exploiting Africa. This word exploitation is very strange. Uh, uh, it means taking advantage of a situation and it's uh, premised, the negative implication is premised on an assumption uh, that if I exploit you or you exploit me uh, and we both, do, we both participate in that exploitation voluntarily that one of us is somehow worse off because the other one is better off, well that's clearly nonsense. Is economic inequality going to be a problem for Africa. The world has just experienced and is experiencing the most extraordinary phenomenon that has ever happened in the world. The most amazing accomplishment of humanity is the virtual elimination of poverty. And it's strange that as that happens, we are talking about it as if there's more of it. And uh, this is simply not so. So rising income inequality is using old-fashioned econometric ways of measuring something, namely how much money you have or the value of capital that you have or assets. Uh, but economists have never claimed that this is telling you much about the quality of life. The poor used to live 20, 21, 25 years and are now there in their living standards are rising. Such access to medical care, food, proper housing, safe water and so on. Uh, to the point where they are now living 65, 70 years and the age life expectancy is conflating for the rich and the poor. That's probably the single most important indicator that in fact there is declining inequality. The amenities of life for the poor, the access to motorized transport, to telecommunications, to medical care, to painkillers, to food, to education. One aspect of Africa's economy that's gotten a fair amount of press in the 21st century is the rise of the telecommunications industry there and um, you see pictures of Africans in what appear to be very poor villages holding cell phones. Have you observed the mobile technology revolution in Africa and, and what effect has it had there? I've traveled around, for example, in some of the remotest parts of planet Earth, the Maasai Mara in uh, south uh, uh, western Kenya, for example, northeastern Tanzania, northwestern Tanzania. And there you see the iconic Maasai herdsman in a, in a red blanket with an assegai in one hand herding some goats and a cell phone in the other hand. And they no longer carry cash. A trader on the side of the road under a tree will transfer the money from one mobile phone to another in a way that even Americans are not yet doing. You've actually said that digital currencies like Bitcoin might be one of the most important developments going forward. Why do you feel that way? So being able to buy and sell and transfer money freely from one part of the world to another uh, without being watched or known or documented is one of the great liberations that the world might experience. Without knowing the term or the technology, Friedrich Hayek, uh, I consider myself more Hayekian than Hayek, predicted something like this in his book, The Denationalization of Money. Uh, which was that there should be completely non-government money and had he known about the technology for cryptocurrency, I'm quite sure that would have excited him a great deal as a, as a Nobel Prize winning economist. Leon Lowe, thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller. <laughs>